Right. So what I tend to do when I am drawing a bird is I start just by blocking in the angle on the bird's back and, and its head. Crows will often sort of have, they'll have a slope to them, sort of a, a, a slope. And the head can be either in line with the body or sometimes held up a little bit. This one is held up. This is going to be where my beak is. Um, uh, one shape that I find very, very helpful is the, neg the negative shape that is just here underneath the throat. So I'll look at that shape. Use that to block in. My, my crow form. Um, I look at where the wing sits on the bird. Where does the sort of the front leading edge of the wing start? And where does it go? Um, in this bird, it's going to go from kind of low down here, and it's going to be tucked up on top of the tail. And <clears throat> the, the legs are going to sort of stick down. So we're going to see parts of the bird's legs. Um, the bird has a hip bone, it has a knee, it has a heel, and that's sometimes what you see sticking out the bottom of the bird. If the bird has its feathers stick, sticking uh, uh, sleep down, you'll see this little bit of, of heel sticking down. And then the bird's um, uh, uh, tarsum metatarsus sticks down from that. And then the foot is on the ground. So we're going to have this. Um, they, they sort of, I'm going to make this bird kind of sleek. And I'm going to make um, it, its head not too big. If I wanted to turn this into more of a raven, ravens have this sort of block head look to them. And what I might do is kind of bulk up the head and also kind of bulk up the throat and chest area here. Um, so if I do this, I'm starting to kind of feel a little bit more raveny. Ravens have a bunch of long feathers right on their throat and, um, and sort of a, a bigger kind of more blocky forehead. So um, I would, you know, there'd be just some proportion changes in there. Also, the raven has, has a really big, massive beak. Um, the crow's beak is going to be a little bit more subtle. Right, so those are just some proportion lines and how I might do those differently if I were looking at crow versus raven. Now I'm going to try to refine this a little bit. So on the beak, I don't want my... Uh, Melinda, I just want to check in with you. Can this be seen fairly clearly on the screen or should I zoom more? Yes. Yeah, we could see the beak. Okay, great. Um, so the corvids often have a little bustle of feathers on top of the, the upper bill and it covers up their nostril. So there's a sort of zone of little bristles that are right up there. My forehead from here is not going to really come up steeply, but it's going to be, might have a slight lip, but then back. And that's going to make, if I came up really steep, then I might feel a little bit more raveny. The eye is on the same line as, as the beak, and often closer to the beak than you think it should be. So that gives me a little bit of kind of crow, crow head shape. Now I'm going to work my way down the bird here. Um, I'm going to have a zone back here of back feathers. And the part of it closest to the wing 
are actually scapular feathers. So sometimes as you kind of, if you can imagine yourself put in, actually I'm gonna put in a big ear patch here. Um, so if you can imagine yourself kind of skiing down the crow, you would come down here and then there'd be a slight little kind of indentation and then you kind of come up over this bump. You're like, woohoo, oh, this is so much fun because we've got these scapular feathers kind of coming down here. All right, so woohoo. So that, that's how to ski on a crow. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm just putting in on just a little hint of there's a little indentation there. On the front end of the wing here, this edge of the wing can be completely covered up by feathers, in which case you'd see an edge like that. Um, or, especially when the bird first lands, you're actually going to see the bird's um, wrist up in here. So you, you would see something more like that, sort of this big curve. But that business, again, can be covered up by feathers. I'm going to draw it so that you see the whole thing. To simplify the wing in my head, there are going to be three major zones. There's going to be a zone up here towards the top part of the wing. These are all called covert feathers. Um, and they have a few rows to them. Down, and, and actually, I, I, the longest of these covert feathers are the bottom row. So sometimes I'll put in a little hint of some of those feathers. So in this zone here, there's actually a whole line of feathers, all like that, all the way across. If I get in here and I draw all those in, it's going to kind of look like dog teeth uh, or like, more like a jack-o'-lantern, right? So I'm going to just suggest that there's a whole bunch of feathers kind of in this axis, kind of parallel in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this first one kind of like that. And the edge, I'm going to kind of punch it and then let that line, let that line kind of drift up into nothing. Right? The next feather, I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to have a few of those feathers that I do that to. And then maybe one or two out here where I'll just kind of go like, oh, look, see, there's more of that. And then people will look at that and they'll say, oh, there's feathers all the way along there. Right? That ends up actually looking better than if I go like this. Because on a bird that's kind of dancing around and bopping around there, you don't see this sort of diagram of like, oh, feather, 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 all lined up like piano keys. You're going to get kind of more of a sense of that there's a mass of feathers, and you'll get to see the crack under, under a few of them. So just generally speaking, just say no to crack. So that's my covert feather zone. Below that is going to be a big block of secondary feathers. And secondary feathers are going to come down. And I'm actually going to have a little bit of a swoop to this bottom edge of it. It's going to come in, get a little bit shorter, come across here. And up like this. this is a whole pile of feathers that are I'm going to draw it over here on the side. Um, what I'm, if I were to kind of draw in every feather in this group, I would get something like this. There's a, there's a small feather. There's a medium length feather. There is a large feather that on the back end here go bonk, bonk, bonk. And then from the edge of that, there's just a whole bunch of other feathers all parallel to each other. So what I want to do is suggest that structure down here in my wing. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw you know, just a little bit of the edge of right here. Maybe let's say there's, there's a little bit. So I'm going to just su suggesting that there are some feathers come down here. And this one is swooping in here. I can have suggest kind of cracks in the feathers 
like this, and also kind of coming the other way. And that suggests that there are these <coughs> secondary feathers of different lengths. Um, actually, I'm going to have this wing end a little bit short of that. For my primary feathers, they're going to stick out beyond this whole thing. So they're in a big wedge that tucks underneath all of this business. There's a little zone of primary coverts in here. There's an allula feather in here if I want to get really kind of anal retentive about structure on these things. But again, I'm not going to get in here and draw on all these feather edges. I'm just going to suggest it. So I'm going to suggest that on the back edge of this, there's a few kind of feathers that are kind of in there. And, and there are some other edges of feathers that are kind of going up this way here. This suggests the detail instead of showing what I'm suggesting here is instead of saying, look, I have these edges of these feathers and these front edges are all lining up this way, I can suggest that information with just a few of those lines. Now, this bird's tail is going to stick down a little bit here. And the tail feathers will go up this way, but I'm going to avoid the temptation of doing this. I'm just going to suggest, look, there's some tail feathers in there. Undertail coverts are a zone of light, fluffy feathers that contour the tail into the body feathers. These lower body feathers down here are really long. So if I pluck one of these feathers out from right in here, I'm going to get something like this. Here's the feather. And it's going to have just this sort of ragged edge down here, a little bit of fluff up towards the top. And because it's got this sort of ragged edge down here, on this edge of the bird, what I will often do is just sort of suggest that there's, this is kind of just rough. This part of the bird's leg is feathered. So there's this little <clears throat> shin guard leg warmer. This is the bird leg warmer right in here. And then its foot comes down from that. On the foot, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to a slightly widened pad here. So it's going to come down straight. And then when it hits the bottom, it's going to slightly widen. And then. The back claw is going to have a big old claw sticking out. Underneath that, there's this sort of cool pad dewlap thing that sticks out like that. So you have a big, a big claw pad. Here were the, these toes. I'm looking kind of at the side view of this, this bird. So I'm not going to draw the foot like this. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to have my foot come down like this and have a claw here and then do this. Right? This would be how the foot looks if you're looking straight down on it. If I'm looking more at the side of the bird, the bird jumping across the parking lot out there. Here I've got the side view of the bird. I want side view of the foot. All right, so I'm going to, the front toes will be a little bit longer than that back one. And there's another one that is behind that. So I kind of get an idea that we've got a side view of a foot instead of a top view of a foot on a side view of a bird. So things that are going to make my buddy here look really crowy is one, a generally sleek feel to it. I'm not going to make the beak here too big. If I do this, watch, I can turn this, 
I'm going to I'm going to just turn this really raveny. I'm going to give this a raveny face for just a minute, and then I'll kind of go back to Crowland. If I go like this, let's see. I want to feel the raven. Feel the raven. Be a raven. So all right. So raven, you're like ah. There, I'm starting to feel kind of raveny. Oh, maybe I overdid it on my beat. This is raven crossed with a toucan. <clears throat> but you get the idea that the proportions there on the beak are going to be really important. So I'm going to erase those raveny bits, give us kind of go back to crow. John, it's yes. Amanda speaking. I'm wondering, could you draw a raven's beak right next to a crow's beak? I'm having some difficulty seeing between the two. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so let me let me do that now. Let's 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 do kind of side by side. Um, so raven um, is going to be. We'll give that, we'll do that right here. So I'm going to make the raven is overall a bigger bird. It's going to have a uh, You're going to get this sort of sense of just a much more massive um, axe of a beak that you really would not want to be pecked by. They also have this zone of feathers in here, this bustle of, of, of feathers that You block your view of the nostril. And on the head, I'm going to go up a little bit steeper on the forehead. They tend to have a much more sort of angular looking head. And uh, when I have the, the eye compared to the beak is going to be sort of proportionately smaller. That makes you sort of feel that like, oh, you have, you have a really, you have a really big beak. Did that help? So just, uh, it is very different proportions. I think I've got this underside of this beak a little bit too curved. Straighten that out. There we go. So I just have a, a more delicate thing here on the crow. This is kind of almost gall-like, this big, this big beak. That's helpful to see it side by side. Do that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I'm liking that. There's a question um, about um, if you'll get talking about the shadows and the feathers. Yes, actually, that's where we're going next. 
I'm about to uh, hit this with some watercolor and sort of show how I would turn this now into a bird that is actually black and how to draw a black bird that has a hint of iridescence in it and um, is where you still can see some, some, some detail. I'm gonna go grab my watercolors. Okay. And again, so that was a very helpful question. And for folks listening, anybody who's got a question, feel free to just uh, raise your paw uh, or, or, or ask. Um, we could put I, it in chat too. The, the what? We could put it in chat as well. Yeah, and, and then so I'm gonna ask somebody else to, to check the chat for me because when I'm doing this, um, I can't read at the same time. And yeah, I've got it covered. Uh, awesome. You rock. You got my back. I'm almost out of water here. So give me 30 seconds to fill this up. I'll be right back. I'm back. Hey, everybody. All right. Um, so here's what. Um, so the wisdom on on watercolor drawing is that you paint light to dark. Um, and so what I would do originally is I'd start kind of building up kind of lighter values in a drawing like this, and then start to kind of get darker and darker and darker and darker. But what I found is very often as I'd be painting my crow, if I'd made these kind of careful lines, I would start to lose those lines because as I build up my crow, all of a sudden I can't see where all my pencil guidelines are. So if I had some really useful lines in there, as I start to paint over the top of this, those lines are gonna to start to go away. And that makes me sad. So you're actually going to see a modification of the usual style of applying watercolor. Um, instead of going from light to dark um, in, a, in a progression, so light, middle values, dark, what you're going to see me do is I'm going to go with my light values. I can still see these lines through it. I then am going to put in all my dark values. And then I'm going to fill in around that with a few more middle tones. So I'm going to do the two ends, the light, the dark, and then fill in towards the middle. And you'll see why, why I do that as, as, as we go. But uh, this is kind of fun because I get to start with just a little bit of iridescence. So depending on where you're looking at the crow, you're going to see um, that there's, a, there's an iridescent sheen. To, to, to a part of it. You'll see blues and purples glowing back at you. And it's really, really lovely. So I'm going to start just by putting in some of my iridescent colors. All right, so I'm putting in some light blues back here on the wing. Um, I'm going to take some purples, put them into the back, and the head. And, um, eh, and maybe I'll put a little bit more blue, some blues into the tail. And I'm good. All right. So that's my that's this undercoat. And part of that is going to show through. And it's going to end up not looking like a purple and blue bird, 
even though there's an awful lot of purple and blue on there. But this is an undercoat that is going to show through some of those really dark darks. Jack, there's a question about the blues and purples that you're using. Someone is asking whether the cool tones are preferred over warm tones for this crow. Um, for, for this, I'm sort of, this is kind of a fairly warm, uh, the, the, with the, with the uh, magenta that is in this purple. That's, um, I want it to be purples and, and blue. So I'm, this, is, this is more of a cyan. Um, instead of a, a, a blue, so that is a, on the warmer side, um, and and yeah, there's uh, so I'm, I'm intentionally using sort of a cyan instead of a light blue, and a um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and that is a warmer purple. Yep. So now comes I'm going to test. Eh, it's still a little bit wet. I'm going to let this dry a little bit. So what you're going to hear in just a moment, I'm hitting this with a hair dryer. I'll be back in a second. If you want to watch, it's really exciting. haircut. I'm learning how to give myself COVID haircuts. Pretty exciting. Um, I want to check the, yeah. Good. All right. Now, I am going to start to put, uh, this is dry, and I'm going to start to put my color on top of this, uh, with my, my darker, sorry, my dark values on top of this. And over here on my palette, I've got several different dark darks. Let me show you what those are. One of them is neutral tint. A neutral tint is a fairly neutral, very kind of black, black. Um, another one of them is Payne's Gray. And as you look at these two side by side, especially on the screen, they look identical. <laughs> um, but the Payne's Gray actually has a little bit more of a bluish cast to it. So if you are painting anything that has yellows in it, you don't want, your, you know, if you're trying to darken stuff with a yellow, you never reach for your Payne's Gray or it just starts turning yellows greenish. Um, but it has a little bit of a, uh, a a uh, blue cast to it. And so actually with all of that, um, the blues and purples in the feathers, I'm gonna be using that Payne's Gray for most of my dark darks here. So I am mixing up a little bit of Payne's Gray there on my brush. I squizzle that around on my palette. I'm gonna test it over here on the side of my paper. Yeah, maybe want that a little bit darker. That's good. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to come along and just start imagining myself being the shadows. And And I can follow those lines that I had exactly, or just kind of get the general idea. Here's this wing. This wing has some feather edges in it. This wing also casts a shadow down on the side of the body. I'm just getting in there and putting 
and in the dark. Here are the undertail coverts. Are going to be all dark. There are those edges of those, those really kind of scruffy feathers. This is going to be all black. The belly of this, also actually before I hit the belly, let me go and just do a little bit more stuff on the wings. There's gonna be a shadow cast underneath the secondary feathers here. And the coverts there. Edges of some of these feathers here. So I'm using those lines that I had before as a rough guide. I don't have to follow exactly. This little bit of the shoulder here and have its own shadow. Um, <clears throat> the edges of these scapular feathers. And right in there. Now the belly of this thing, if the light is hitting behind it, the belly in here is going to be in darkness. And what I'm doing is I'm making these strokes kind of in the line of the direction that the feathers are laying. So in case any of my brush strokes show through, those will, those will feel, um, but it, it, won't, it won't look funky. There's a big ear patch. I'm gonna go all dark on the lowers. Kind of gives it an angry bird's look. A little bit of highlight left on the eye. Um, On the lower part of the bill, I'm going to go all black and, and just a little hint in the top there. Maybe underneath the eye here, I can give it a few kind of sleepy marks. Sometimes there's these kind of curls of feathers coming in there. So what I've done is I've come in here and I just went, I went crazy. I went all in on my darks. Um, now what I can do is I can just start putting midtones on top of this. And those, um, those darks are going to show through. Well, let's put the shadow of this these primary feathers here coming across the tail there. All right. So that is, and now I'm not going to lose those darks. And now I let that dry and it's almost dry, almost. Um, and um, I'll then be putting in my midtones. For my midtones, I'm going to be using a little bit more of this Payne's Gray. I'm also going to be mixing in some Bloodstone Genuine, which is a very, very dark value brown. Um, sometimes you can get a little bit of a kind of a warm brown glow in the 
feathers of these birds. Maybe rather than wait for this, I'm going to hit it one more time with the hairdryer. <laughs> Palette, my bloodstone genuine is hiding right over here. Um, it's a wonderful dark value color from Daniel Smith. When you see it in what they call mass tone, or just sort of you know, straight out of the tube, it looks it looks really black, doesn't it? But if I dilute it a little bit, um, let me get some more kind of cleaner. It has it's sort of a purpley brown. And that's going to be a wonderful color for the back of this, this, this bird. So I'm going to take some of my Bloodstone Genuine, mix it into this. This whole area here is for mixing just anything dark, 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 dark. So I can take blues and, oh, and greens and anything that would be really kind of a dark value color. I can bring it into here. I'm going to add a little bit more water to it. Here I'm squeezing my water brush. And that helps me control the amount of water that goes in there. Testing out on the sides, the amount of pigment to the amount of, um, of, of water in the brush. And once I like what I've got, I can just come along and paint. Test. Yeah, the um, And here I'm just sort of starting with some lighter value stuff and you'll see me working my way progressively getting darker. But isn't it, you can sort of paint over this stuff and those dark lines show through. Now I want to blend this back edge with this. Okay, so I've taken a lot of the, the, the paint out of my brush. I'm just going to soften some of these edges here with water. And then now that it's wet, and I'll come back in uh, 
part of what you're seeing on the screen is a lot of kind of sheen of just sort of wet, wet bird, uh, wet paint. And when this dries, that sheen will be gone. So I'm just sort of filling in from these lights into the darks, letting some of those edges disappear. <clears throat> Now that purple on the back right in here, in here is feeling a little bit too intense for me. It feels this, like grackles, you'll definitely see that on a grackle, right? But um, on, a, on a crow, it's gonna be a little bit more subtle than that. So I'm going to kind of mute that out a little bit. And if I, mute it too much while it's still like this. I want some of that blue back in the wing. I'm getting a clean brush, stroking some of that stuff out, and I can pull some of those colors back out. See that? So I can come along here. I can get just a little bit of that color back in. See so by turning this, so we can hold this at a different angle. To uh, I think I need to just get this to dry this, and then you'll be able to see kind of what is paint, what is not. Part of the problem is that this is painted on on a rather absorbent paper, but there's I think also because the screen is getting a little bit of reflection. Um, let me dry this a bit and then you'll be able to see what the paint actually looks like. I'll be back in just a second. Hard to see on the way the camera is 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 projecting it, but in here I'm seeing a little bit too much of a harsh transition between that black shadow that I put in and the midtones. Um, and so a few places in here I'm just going to take a little bit more Bloodstone Genuine and fill in a little bit of the transition in those those midtones. So I grab my Bloodstone. Test it.
And I'm going to, with a clean brush, soften a few of those edges. And I am close to the stop point. I put a little bit of dark right along the back. and then come in with a damp brush, soften that edge. I want a little bit more of a change in that shape right at the base of the nape. And Lastly, I'm going to get my point of my water brush very sharp and I just am going to suggest that this is bristles in here. My crow is just about done. I'm going to hit this with the dryer one more time while you're working on your drawing. I'll bring this back and show you one final thing I can do just to get a little bit more pop in the picture. I like the way that the, the colors are blending into each other. Um, what doesn't show up on your screen is that this area in here actually has some warm sort of reddish browns in it that kind of give it a, a little bit more warmth. So I'm seeing these reddish browns, the blues and the purples. I like the way that those are dancing with each other. Um, I'm now going to just go around and um, kind of crisp up some of the edges of this bird. I want that to be I'm just hitting this with what my daughters call the mark pen. We got one of these from Mark Simmons some time ago. He gave it to uh, my daughter, so I'm gonna. Take my, it's a zebra pen. That's a neat pen because it, uh, if I go lightly with it, it makes thin lines and I go a little bit more heavy pressure. Mark Simmons, by the way, is teaching at Wild Wonder. I'll be taking his class. Amazing, amazing teacher. And if you kind of meet him online there, you'll also see that he's a, he's a beautiful person. I have a lot of respect for the way he walks in this world. Humility and generosity. So part of my pop, I get with the mark pen. That just sort of takes some of those rougher edges and kind of goes like, 
you know, here's, here's the boundaries of my bird. This is a bit confusing in here, isn't it? Um, maybe add just a little bit more value down into that. So to say like this area is part of my tail. Another thing that I can do to sort of add a little bit of final touch to my picture is I have a, a, a just a, a light blue, um, a, a light blue pencil here. And I'm going to do a test and see how well this shows up. This might be a little bit too light. I don't know that'll work. And I'm just, I'm coming along a few places in here and just suggesting what this does is it puts a little bit of, so I've got this dark down and what this does is puts a light in the dark. Can you see that? Let's, let's zoom down on this, ready? Zoom, 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 All right? So, um, So there's just a little bit of light in the darkness. That look cool. A little bit is going to go a long way. So I just, a couple of those in there are gonna suggest that there are feather edges. I do much more than that and it's gonna kill it. A little hint of some fluffy. The danger with this part is it's fun. You start doing this, you're just like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Then you get this everywhere on the picture. And you, I think I should have stopped a little bit earlier. So maybe I stop now. The blue pencil, this is a Faber-Castell polychromos pencil. Um, uh, ultramarine heel, light, light ultramarine, light ultramarine. This bird, it does feel fairly static because, you know, it's got one leg, one wing. If you wanted to make the whole drawing a little bit more interesting, you know, I could have thrown in another wing back here or even crossing over this one. You could have throw in another leg here in that sort of a position. And then it doesn't look like you've got that, you know, the one winged, one legged bird. Um, but uh, that is a little bit of guidance on drawing a crow. Um, and I hope that that was, was, was useful. We, we kind of went through um, just a, a few of the, the, the strategies that I use when, when painting something like this. Again, my approach here is, is it was a little bit off the traditional track that you're on when you're doing watercolor. Like you see watercolor classes, they say start light, build your way at the end, you're dropping in your darkest darks. Um, but here I put in some of those background light value colors and then I let them dry and even made sure it was dry with my hair dryer because later on, remember you saw me lifting off some of that wet paint and that blue color stayed underneath. That was because it was all dry and this wet paint that was then sitting on top of it, I was able to grab that and pull it off. And um, 
and so I started with that those uh, sort of iridescence colors. Then I put in my darkest darks, and then built into those midtones. And at the end, I also was using a little bit of that Bloodstone Genuine paint to kind of reinforce a few of my dark darks. Um, I really like the way that that um, the Bloodstone Genuine kind of works with um, things like you, you'll you'll see this sort of warmth in it, but it'll still be this dark value. It's Thank you, Daniel Smith. Um, so that's, I think, uh, kind of some useful, useful stuff for you folks. I hope that this was fun for you. I hope you got a few tricks out of it. And what I'm going to suggest you do is um, a crow, a blackbird, a raven. Take one of these and do three drawings, three drawings, um, and on the first one, overemphasize going too dark. On the second one, um, see what happens when you are not really putting in those darks as much. And on the third one, draw a bird based on the lessons that you got from the other two drawings. And this third one, does not have to be, like in the fairy tales, the third one is just right. This third one does not have to be just right. The third one is also an experiment, right? The third one is a learning study and you wanna kind of learn from it, but actively scavenge ideas from a little bit on the lighter side, a little bit on the darker side. Now I'm gonna mess with these two and see what happens. So do not put the pressure on it that in the third one, it all goes bing and it's perfect. Right, just 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 play with it. Um, see what it's like to have some you know, some darks down there if you're doing watercolor stuff, and and to pull in the um, to 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 put some washes on top of that. You can lift some of those out. Just sort of see what happens. Um, and if you're thinking, well, that's great if you're doing watercolor, but I'm doing colored pencils. Um, come to my Wild Wonder workshop on drawing with colored pencils. We're going to have a fun workshop on just sort of straight up, let's like, we're not doing any watercolor. We're just like, what would it be like to kind of go out with a big old set of, I mean, not a, even a big old set, a medium sized set of colored pencils and just see how much bizarre you can get out of that in the field. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, again, want to let uh, just sort of a reminder for all you folks. If you can't afford to join us for Wild Wonder, um, we still want you there, right? Let us know, we can hook you up. If you can't afford it, that supports um, me and the teachers and the people who are putting this on and it, and it helps our community, that's great. But the most important thing is that we're doing this together. So I just wanna invite, I just wanna let everybody know um, that um, you're, you are part of this community and we are here for you and um, we can make this, this work in a way that works for all of us. Um, thank you very much, and I hope you had fun today. <laughs>